So, I'd like to talk this afternoon about Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, How I Wonder What You Are, a well-known uh, nursery rhyme, but lots of very deep meaning behind it. I mean, I'm sure we've all looked up at the sky and we've seen the stars and we've wondered what they are. And I think probably our ancestors, the first humans, maybe 200,000 years ago, they must have looked up and wondered what was up there. So I'm going to, in 18 minutes, explore a little bit of what we know now about what's up there, give you maybe an idea of the size of things. And so what I hope is next time you look at the sky, you'll see the stars twinkling and you'll have a new respect. Okay, so why am I dressed up in this very hot costume? It's almost precisely 400 years ago to the day that the first observations of the sky were made uh, with a telescope. Right? The first day of the modern era was almost precisely 400 years ago. And what I'm going to talk about today, I think surely Galileo would have given his right arm to know about, or maybe his back teeth, if he had any back teeth. So, I'll press on. When we look at the sky, this is what we would see in the sky now, looking south, Some, somewhere like Ross Lake or something north of Galway, looking south. South is roughly that direction. And this is what you'd see, of course. Um, you'd not see many stars there. But let's turn off the, the daylight. And so if you happen to be there and somebody turned the daylight off, this is what you would see, I promise you. 14, 10, 24 seconds, June 11, 2010, somewhere near Galway. And that, that is actually precisely correct. And what do we see up there? Most of them are stars. And there's bright ones and faint ones. They twinkle. And the twinkling is something to do with the fact that we live at the bottom of a deep atmosphere. You can go into space and you see stars much more clearly, but I don't have time to discuss that today. But there's a pattern of stars there, which I hope you all recognise, almost precisely south at the moment, so you can't see it in the night time, it's visible in the daytime, which is the constellation we refer to as Orion. And almost everybody has recognised Orion, this pattern here, as a human figure, right from maybe 2,000 years ago. Not necessarily a male figure, So that's a nice program, but it, I'm going to get rid of it and go to another one which shows me better what I want to show you. So this is another picture of what's in the sky now, but rather than pretending to be realistic, it's a map of the whole sky, so it's somewhat distorted near to the edges. Right, so above your head is the centre of the screen, south is the bottom of the screen, north is the top. Okay, so east is, <laughs> is the left and west is the right. Okay, and what do we see? With our naked eye. What did Galileo see and other people saw? Well, first of all, they saw lots and lots of stars. And the stars don't stay in the same place, they move around. And they move around such that the, the whole sky rotates about a particular place you can see it moving. That's, that, by the way, that's one minute of movement. You may be surprised. One minute. But what you see is that it is moving around the star up here. How do we understand that? Well, of course, the sky isn't moving. We're moving. The Earth is rotating like a spinning top. And where does the axle point to? Well, it points up there and down there. That's where everything appears to be spinning around. And it goes around a little bit less than one day. So it's over a whole year, it goes around <coughs> once per day plus once. So everything moves on a little bit during the year. But in addition, there's a number of other objects which move along this blue line marked here. And this would include the sun, the moon, and all sorts of other things which people knew about as planets 
Now, planets, because they don't stay in a fixed place with respect to the stars, but they move or they wander amongst the stars. So what do we now think this looks like? And what Galileo was one of the people that was instrumental in giving us this view. <coughs> this is what we think it looks like. This is looking at the solar system. The solar system consists of the, of the sun, plus the planets going around it, eight of them, eight of them, <laughs> out to Neptune. And they all travel in these paths which are drawn here. Remarkably, maybe you weren't aware again, absolutely remarkably, these paths are all fall in the same plane, almost as if they were drawn on the same piece of paper. Look. Remarkably. Except for Pluto. And that's one of the reasons why Pluto is not a planet. Okay? So, let's go back to the other view. The other thing we see up there is this fuzzy band of light that crosses the sky. Right? If you're in a dark place, you can see that. Um, if you live in Dublin or somewhere, you never see it. And that, of course, is the Milky Way, which we now realise is a very large number of stars, of which our star is just one member. So it's a group of stars, maybe, maybe something between 200,000 million and 400,000 million of them depending upon some certain assumptions. Right? So that's the group of stars that we belong to. And we think there are other groups of stars of the same type. Maybe another 200,000 million of those in total. So you can work out how many stars there are. It's an, it's an extremely large number. And of those stars, the Sun is the most ordinary example. It's not the biggest or the smallest or the hottest or the coldest or the faintest or the brightest or the oldest or the youngest or any of those things. So it's the most ordinary of a very large number of stars except for one thing, which is we are. It's the only place that we know of in, in the whole of that universe where there's actually life. It's the only place we know of for certain. Now most people think there's probably life elsewhere but we don't know that, and we have no way of judging the probability of finding life until we find it. So for the moment, we may be unique in the whole of that vast amount of space. Let, let's talk about that vast amount of space a little bit. Let's talk about the size of things. The solar system. The solar system consists of the sun and not very much else. The sun is 99% of everything in the solar system. Most of the rest is Jupiter and Saturn. Um, we're the sort of dust in the attic of the solar system. So how big is the sun compared with, with us, for example? There is the sun. There's a, there's a modern picture of the sun. Although Galileo was the first person to see these black marks on the sun. We call sunspots. There's the Earth from space. Do you think that's about the right size? It's much too big. Much too big. I can show you something on the sun which is about the right scale. If I showed you the scale, you wouldn't be able to see it. That mark there is about the right size for the sun, for the Earth compared with the sun. So the sun is only about 100, the Earth is 100th of the size of the sun. So it's a millionth of the mass of the sun. It's extremely small. Let's try and Think about the size of things. This is a scale model. This is a, this is a Florentine two ducat coin, which is the same size precisely as two euro coins. <laughs> and this is our scale model of the solar system. Let's say the solar system is out to Neptune's orbit. Right? Can you imagine all that out there? There's the solar system. On that scale, the sun is much too small to see. It's as small as a speck of smoke drifting around in there. You wouldn't see it, apart from the fact it's very bright, of course. Okay? The Earth is a hundred times smaller than that insignificant speck of smoke in the middle there. Where's the next planet? 
The next, where's the next star? I'm sorry. The next star to the, to, to the sun is relatively close to us. As things go, on that scale, it's about a kilometre away. And there's nothing in between. So it's very big and it's very empty. I said that we belong to this group of stars called the Milky Way, the Milky Way galaxy. It, it, roughly, if you look at it, it looks like a fried egg. It's flattened, and that's why it appears across a, as a band across the sky. You're looking into the, into the white of the fried egg. How big would that be on that scale? It's about as big as Europe. And where would the next one be? Where would you get to the next galaxy? One of the other 200,000 million. Well, you have to go about Australia and back 10 times. So it's very big and it's very empty, right? I hope that gives you a, a, an idea of the scale of things. It makes me feel very small. I showed you earlier, it just so happens that if you were to turn the, the daylight off and look south, you'd see Orion today. You can see it in the evening sky in the autumn. Uh, and Orion, we're familiar with the idea, has a bright red star at the top called Betelgeuse, bright blue star at the top called Rigel, some bright blue stars called the Belt, and then some stars we call the Sword, and a fuzzy patch halfway down the, down the Sword. Now, the reason I draw attention to, to Orion is that what Galileo didn't know, had no way of knowing, is that stars like the universe, must be born. And they must also die. What we now think happened is that the universe started with some, with, with some, some hydrogen, a little bit of helium, and a little bit of beryllium about 13.8 thousand million years ago. And the first stars were formed by this hydrogen gas collapsing down into, into quite big chunks. Big chunks maybe. 50, 100, 200 times the mass of the sun. The centre got hot as it got compressed, it lit up, it became a star, and such massive stars run through their fuel very, very quickly. And maybe after only a few tens of millions of years, they ran out of fuel, hydrogen, and exploded. And then, after the explosion, they spread into interstellar space, all the gas and dust, and all the stuff which was made in the star, during its life. And what we can see here is a mass of gas and dust glowing, formed from a star that sometime in the past, not very long ago probably, maybe only 50 million years ago or something, exploded, blasted all the stuff into interstellar space. And what we know is that in the middle of that cloud, new stars are forming. See, our star is going to last for maybe another four or five thousand million years, but it won't last forever. So it's nice to show places where we can see stars forming as well as stars dying. By the way, this is a remarkable picture I had to show you. This is a picture of Betelgeuse. The stars are so far away, in general you'd have said that they're just points of light, even in the biggest telescopes, except for Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is not only very, very close, it is very, very big. The size of Betelgeuse is bigger than the orbit of Mars. It's enormous. And that's a picture of the surface of Betelgeuse taken with these four telescopes plus some little ones here. It's a remarkable first picture, actually showing structure on another star just like the Sun. So this is the three stars of the belt of Orion. You can see the, the gas and dust lit up by these very hot young stars. They may be only a million years old, really, really, really young. And in this cluster of, the, uh, of in this gas, you can see there are new stars forming. The cloud is lit up by these four brilliant, very hot young stars, which we call the stars of the Trapezium Nebula. Okay. I want to end up talking about what happens to stars when they run out of fuel? Let's take a star like our sun, but maybe a bit bigger. Our sun is one solar mass, by definition. 
But if we take in a star of maybe five or ten solar masses, what happens to it when it runs out of fuel? Well, it starts off with hydrogen, a bit of helium, a bit of other stuff from the original star. Turns the hydrogen into helium. And when it's running out of helium, uh, of hydrogen, it starts to turn the helium into lithium and beryllium and boron and carbon and all of the stuff, up to and including something like silicon or iron. But you can't make heavy elements, heavier than iron, in an ordinary star. There's no other place we can make these things that we know of. The universe started with hydrogen. Everything that you see, every heavy material you see, was formed in a star. So, there's iron in this room. There's iron in my blood and your blood. Where did the iron come from? It came from an exploding star, like that one. So every atom in your bodies has been through an exploding star like that one at least once before. Which is a remarkable thought, yeah? <coughs> is it convincing explosion, yes? This is the remains of a star which was seen to explode by the ancient Chinese in the year 1054. We call it the Crab Nebula because of a, a fancy resemblance to, to the crab. It was discovered in, in Ireland in about 1850. Some of us think we should change the name to the Irish Nebula and we're working on it. We actually know which star it was that exploded. That thing there is the remnant of the star that exploded. How do we know that? Well, the sun <coughs> rotates about every 24 days. Right? That is the collapsed core of the star like the sun, <coughs> which is collapsed down. When something is spinning and collapses, it spins faster. Yeah? Someone ice dancing is arms out, spinning, brings the arms in and goes faster. Well, stars do the same thing, except this thing has started off a lot bigger than the sun and has collapsed down to about the size of Galway. And we know that it is spinning 33 times every second. How do we know that? Well, it produces a flash on its surface, like a lighthouse beam. <coughs> and if you look at it, what you see is this thing making a flash like a lighthouse beam as it comes past you. And that star there flashes at you 33 times a second. Now, I've heard it said that astronomers are divided into two categories. Those people who study this object, the Crab Nebula, and everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to tell you that we belong to the category that study the Crab Nebula. So thank you for your attention.